Hello, this is Professor Fordham, and you are about to experience the excitement that is cause in fact. Yes, this is the third element of a claim for negligence, and what I'm going to do here is just a brief overview of cause in fact for your tort excitement and pleasure. Start off with is but for causation, which is the major test for causation, um, at least cause in fact. We'll talk about how to frame the question. Then we're going to move into a couple of exceptions, alternate liability and the substantial factor test. Boom, just like that. With but for causation. There's a trick to always get but for causation questions correct, and that qu trick is to first apply the general rule, which is but for causation, and then apply any exceptions. You want to do this with all causation questions. Always start with but for causation. So if you happen to see a fact scenario that looks like, oh, wow, that looks like the substantial factor, or, oh, so much excitement, it's alternate liability. You have to restrain yourself and say, whoa, I remember, wait, I'm going to do but for causation first because I'm going to win this thing. So we start with the general rule, which is but for causation, before we move to any exceptions. All right, now, last semester we had some fun talking about products liability. Um, and we talked about but for causation. And we had this great rule that a product defect is a cause in fact of plaintiff's harm if the harm would not have occurred if the product had not been def defective. Well, now that we're in the land of negligence, not much is going to change. We're just going to replace a few words here. So last semester we said we would compare what did happen with the product being defective with what would have happened had the product been defect free. Now we switch it up a bit. Instead, we're going to say defendant's negligence is a cause in fact of plaintiff's harm if the harm would not have occurred if the defendant had not been negligent. Again, we're comparing what did happen when the defendant was negligent with what would have happened if the defendant had not been negligent. Now, one thing we mentioned just briefly last semester is that plaintiff has the burden of showing that it's more likely than not that the negligence of the defendant was the cause in fact of her damages. That's going to become more important this semester. It's going to become more important as we move into negligence in particular because it gets more complicated in negligence than it was in the easy days of products liability. So, we've talked about misfeasance and nonfeasance. Misfeasance, when you take an action and you do so without using reasonable care. Nonfeasance, when you fail to take an action and there was some duty for you to take that action. Like you failed to take some precaution. Well, if the defendant did something the defendant shouldn't have, in other words, took an action without using reasonable care, we can test but for causation by saying if the defendant had not negligent act, plaintiff would not have suffered harm. Insert negligent act, insert harm. So if the defendant was driving drunk, you would say if the defendant had not driven drunk, plaintiff would not have suffered being run over by plaintiff's car. Now, there are times when the defendant fails to do something that the defendant should have done. So, like throwing a, a rock at someone and not saying duck, or um, failing to have a bargee on board to watch the barge so it doesn't sink. So, we can set it up that way, too. If the defendant had taken the precaution, um, like having a bargee on board, or yelling, hey, watch out, I'm throwing a rock, then plaintiff would not have suffered the harm. So you can really take the but-for causation either way.
So um, when we were talking about breach of duty, I gave you a hypothetical about somebody falling backwards down a flight of stairs. And the question was, well, how do we look at that? From what perspective? There's the ex ante perspective before they fell down the stairs. And then there's the accident that happened while they were falling down the stairs. And then there's the ex post perspective. Hindsight is 2020. We can see, oh, that's what happened. So maybe beforehand, before the guy fell down the stairs, he didn't see that there was a banana peel on top stair. After the accident, it's really easy to see that there's a banana peel on the top stair. So ex ante is when we're talking about whether there was a breach of duty. So when we're doing the hand analysis, we say, well, when he was looking at the stairway, would a reasonable person have noticed that banana peel sitting there? And so it's from the perspective of somebody before the accident standing in the shoes of the dependent and we ask what would a reasonable person standing in those shoes because our defendants never reasonable um, well occasionally but would a reasonable person standing in their shoes have seen that banana peel and carefully stepped over it an exposed perspective is what we use in cause and fact hey we can see what caused it like you know if there wouldn't have been a banana peel there he wouldn't have tripped and fallen down the stairs. But maybe it's not a but for. Maybe his shoes were untied as well. And he actually, the banana peel was just there. He never touched it. It's actually his untied shoelaces that caused him to fall down the stairs. So unlike breach analysis, with cause and fact analysis, we're looking ex post from after the accident happened. Okay. So now let's look at this case, New York Central v. Grimstad. Grimstad and his wife rented a barge from New York Central. And um, at some point, another boat bumped into the barge and uh, Mr. Grimstad fell off the barge into the water. His wife ran down under the barge to try and grab a flotation device or a lifesaver. And um, by the time she got back up, um, he, had, he was under the water and he ended up drowning. So first question is, well, did, um, did they owe, him, owe a duty to poor Mr. Grimstad? Did the, the New York Central who rented the lifeboat, oh, or excuse me, at the barge owe a duty to the Grimstads? And the answer is, well, probably yes. Um, when you rent somebody your property, you have a duty to either have it properly equipped or to let them know that it's not properly equipped. So certainly there was a duty. Did they breach the duty? Well, it seems pretty um, clear that you would want to have flotation rings or life preservers and that type of thing on a boat so that people don't drown. Um, and I think you could say that a reasonable person renting a barge would have that on board. So most likely they, the plaintiffs would prevail on duty and breach of duty because they failed to have life preservers. We can frame the question like this. The defendant should have supplied life preservers. Then we get to cause and fact. Was the defendant's breach the cause in fact of plaintiff's harm? Well, um, here we say if the defendant had supplied the life preservers, would plaintiff have suffered the harm? Well, if there'd been life preservers on board and um, the wife went down to go grab the life preservers and she came up with them, he was already under the water. He'd already drowned. And so in this case, the court said, well, you know, even there was a duty, even though the duty was breached, um, the breach was not the cause, in fact, of the harm because the plaintiff would have drowned even if uh, the defendant had done everything right. Based on the circumstances, based on the fact the plaintiff could not swim, it was bound to happen anyway. But let's think about this for a second. What if instead of saying, that the defendant should have 
supplied life preservers, the plaintiff said, you know, the defendant should have provided a netting around the whole barge to prevent. So if anybody fell off the barge, they'd fall into the net instead of into the water. Well, that that's a much more uh, a much higher standard of what you have to do. Um, and the problem that would come is if you did a hand analysis on this. Okay, well, if we're saying that the untaken precaution, the thing that the defendant failed to do was providing netting around the whole barge, well, putting a net around the whole barge, that's going to be pretty expensive. It's also going to be pretty inconvenient. It's going to slow down the barge. It's going to make it harder to get things on and off the barge. Um, it's going to cause a lot of problems. That said, if you could convince the jury that the defendant should have provided a net around the whole barge, then when we come down here and we do cause and fact, hey, we're good to go. If the defendant had provided, provided netting around the whole barge, the plaintiff probably wouldn't have suffered the harm because he would have fell into the net and he would have been saved. Um, so one thing that you have to notice is the untaken precaution that you claim when you're asserting that defendant breached a duty needs to be the same as the untaken precaution you're claiming um, caused the injuries. You can't at one point say, oh, you should have had life preservers. And then when you get to cause in fact and said, change it and say, oh, you should have put a net around the whole barge. You need to stick with the same um, untaken precaution or the same claim. Now, one thing that students sometimes do that you want to watch out for is they might say, well, the defendant should have used reasonable care, and if they had used reasonable care, plaintiff wouldn't have suffered the harm. Well, that's just kind of sneaky. The problem is um, it's not specific enough. How do you know whether it would have happened if they had used reasonable care? You need to be specific about what that reasonable care is so that you can do an analysis that is deep enough that it actually makes sense. So come up with a specific thing that the plaintiff's going to claim that the defendant should have done differently when you're doing the breach analysis. And then when you get to the cause and fact analysis, you can identify that and do real analysis on whether that untaken precaution would have actually made a difference. Okay. Okay, let's say you're driving to school and that there is an older gentleman in front of you driving at a very slow speed. You're impatient, you're running late, like I say, and you know that your professor will go crazy if you show up at school late, so you're kind of tailgating the gentleman in front of you, um, thinking that you might be able to inspire him to move faster, like that ever works. But anyway, so the, the older gentleman sees that he might be coming up to a red light sometime in the foreseeable future, so he starts to put on the brakes. You start to slow down too, seeing him, and um, just then there's a drunk driver behind you that doesn't see any of this, isn't really paying attention to the road, and he slams in to the both of you. Boom. Just like that, um, he slams into you, causing you to slam into the older gentleman. Now the question is, well, certainly you and the drunk driver had a duty because you're engaged in an affirmative act. So did the old man, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Affirmative act of driving a car creates a risk, so you had a duty to use reasonable care. Did you violate that duty? Well, you were tailgating. It's against the law. We could do negligence per se, um, but in any case, most likely you were not using reasonable care because you were tailgating the person. Then the question is, um, did the drunk driver breach uh, his duty? Well, certainly he was driving drunk. That's an easy one. Then we ask the question about cause and fact. So let's think about this.
if the drunk guy had not been driving drunk, would plaintiff have suffered the harm? Well, no, because um, you wouldn't have run into the older gentleman, presumably, because you were following closely but vigilantly watching what was going on. So it's the drunk guy's fault if he's the cause, in fact, the harm. But wait, that doesn't seal the deal. Um, if the tailgater, that's you, had not been tailgating, would plaintiff have suffered the harm? Well, um, it that kind of depends. Maybe if you wouldn't have been tailgating, then um, the drunk driver would have bashed into you and you would have been far enough away that the old man wouldn't have suffered any harm whatsoever. Or maybe the drunk driver was driving so quickly that um, no matter how far back you were, he would have thrown your car forward into the drunk driver's car. The thing to notice here is that there can be more than one person being negligent at the same time. We call that multiple concurrent causes. And the point to emphasize is this. There can be more than one but for cause of an injury. There's no, it's no excuse to say, well, wait, 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 I'm off the hook because you caused it. It's not like, oh, he did it or she did it or anything like that. It's you both did it. So don't, don't think that by saying, well, we can say somebody else did it, that you can get off the hook. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the drunk driver was certainly much more at fault by driving drunk than you were at fault by um, tailgating. And um, it doesn't matter that the accident wouldn't have happened if the drunk driver wouldn't have been there at all. Um, you're still a pet for a cause. But the drunk driver being more at fault and you being less at fault, that's not going to change cause in fact. You're still the cause in fact of the harm. What that's going to change is when we get to damages and we talk about apportionment of liability, you would be apportioned a smaller amount of the liability than the drunk driver because your culpableness or your negligence was not as great as the negligence of the drunk driver. But with respect to cause and fact, it doesn't matter. You're both a cause and fact of the harm. Okay, so the first thing you do always is attempt but for causation. But there's sometimes when but for causation doesn't give the plaintiff the result that the plaintiff wants. And in those situations, the plaintiff can take advantage of one of the exceptions to but for causation. So the first exception I want to talk about is alternate liability. And this comes up basically when forensics fails, when um, you can't figure out what exactly was the cause and fact of the harm. We've got the Summers v. Tice case. We've got the plaintiff and we've got two defendants. And then we've got this dumb bird that's in the middle. The two defendants shoot at the bird um, and they're shooting buckshot, I believe. So um, a piece of buckshot goes into the plaintiff's eye and it causes him to lose sight in that eye. Um, the question is, is defendant one or defendant two liable for it? So if you're thinking about this, how is this different from multiple concurrent causes that we just talked about? Well, let's see. Um, how many negligent parties were there? Well, both of the defendants shot towards the plaintiff. So there definitely were two negligent parties, just as when we were talking about multiple concurrent causes. The next question is, how many of these parties actually contributed to plaintiff's harm? Well, there was one piece of buckshot that went in plaintiff's eye. We don't know whether it was from the defendant's gun or from defendant two's gun. It was from one of the guns, but we don't know which one. Um, but there was only one 
of the parties that actually contributed to the harm. So knowing that, if we did but for causation for this, um, we'd say if defendant one had not shot towards the plaintiff, would plaintiff have suffered the harm? Well, I don't know. If defendant one hadn't shot toward the plaintiff, maybe defendant two's buckshot would have gotten in his eye. So defendant one gets off the hook saying, well, you know, but for me shooting towards it, the other guys would have gotten his eye. Um, defendant two can get off for the same reason. He says, well, if, if um, defendant two had not shot towards him, would he have suffered the harm? Well, we don't know because we don't know whether the buckshot came from defendant's gun or the plaintiff's. So it's a situation where it could be either of them, but we don't know which one to blame. Um, and we know it only came from one of the two. So what are we going to do in this situation? But for causation would leave us with no liability for either of them because we can't say with certainty that either of them um, was the source of the buckshot. Um, so do we just let them off the hook? No, of course not. This is tort law. Instead, we'll just come up with an exception. And thus we have the exception that where there are multiple defendants, but only one that caused the plaintiff's harm, the burden's going to shift to the defendants to show lack of causation if these three things are true. First, all the defendants were negligent. So notice in this case, both of the defendants shot towards the bird. They were both negligent. All of the defendants are equally likely to have caused plaintiff's harm. Well, certainly they were both shooting in the same direction at the same time, and the court seems to think they were about the same distance. And third, it's impossible to know which defendant caused the plaintiff's harm. Here, we just don't know because nowadays, maybe we could get forensic evidence to look at the buckshot and to look at the guns and figure out which one the buckshot came from. But um, at the time of this case, you just couldn't do that. Let me give you another example. So let's say there's a piano and um, A, we'll say Alice, oh, it's a him. So Alan stores his furniture in warehouses operated by three different people. First, he stores it at B's place, then he stores it at C's place, then he stores it at D's place. At the end of the time, he gets his piano back and he finds that it's been damaged. Um, by one of these people, but he doesn't know which of them damaged the piano. Was it B, was it C, or was it D? Does this qualify for alternate li liability? No, it doesn't. A has the burden of proving whether the dent was caused by B, C, or D. We're not going to um, we're not going to apply alternate liability in this case because um, they, first off, we don't know if all three were negligent. Um, maybe one of them broke it a little bit, another one broke it more, another one broke it more, but we don't know. There's no facts here that tell us that all three of them was negligent. In fact, it seems most likely that only one of them was negligent. We don't know that all three were equally likely to have caused the harm. Um, maybe they all three were had the piano for the same amount of time, but we don't know, um, or had the same conditions. We don't know. Um, it is impossible for or difficult for the uh, plaintiff to tell which person caused the harm, but that's too bad. So um, alternate liability is something that comes up in the rare situation when there are multiple defendants and um, all the defendants were negligent and it's impossible to know which of the defendant actually caused the harm, but we know it was only one of them. We know it was in a combined effort. That is the rare case when alternate liability will apply. It doesn't come up that often in real life, comes up much more often in uh, fake life on exams. Okay, exception number two. 
the substantial factor test. You use this when um, the harm just seems inevitable, um, and yet we think it's unfair for the defendant to get off the hook. So, I've said that there could be more than one cause of an injury. Sometimes one of the causes of the injury is not a person, it's just a situation, like a tornado or something that's happened. All right, so to apply a substantial factor, there's a great case called the Kingston case where we had um, two fires. One was started negligently um, by somebody, and the other one was believed to have been started naturally by lightning or something like that. And what happened is the two fires burned, they merged together, and they got to Kingston's house. The problem is the question, or the question is in any case, whether the negligently started fire was a cause, in fact, of the house burning to the ground. And you can see the defendant's going to argue, well, you know, even if I, if I hadn't been negligent, the naturally started fire would have gotten there and burned the house down anyway. So I'm not a but-for cause of burning down the house. Um, plaintiff's not going to like that very much because then the plaintiff's not going to be able to recover because the naturally started fire um, is a but-for cause of of burning down the house as well, or is, well, actually it's not a but-for cause because if the naturally started fire wouldn't have, um, but for the naturally started fire, uh, the negligently started fire would have burned down the house. So we're at chicken and eggs. We're not quite sure which one um, to call the but-for cause. And we can't really say both of them are a but-for cause because um, if one hadn't done it, the other would have. So before we answer this perplexing riddle, let's think about a little bit the, uh, the situation. Let me change it up just a little bit. So here the problem is, if the defendant had not negligently left, lit the fire, would plaintiff have suffered the house burned down? The answer is, well, um, yes, the house would have burned down anyway. And so, strictly speaking, there's no but for causation. Let's take another hypothetical. Let's say that um, there was a negligently started fire and naturally started fire, but the fires didn't merge. Instead, the naturally started fire got there first, burned the place to the ground, so much so that there wasn't even one piece of wood on top of another. And then the negligently started fire arrived there. Was the negligently started fire a cause, in fact, of the house being burned down? Well, no, because there was nothing left to burn down when the negligently started fire got there. Um, if somebody is dead and you run them over, they're more dead. Now, the, after the damage has already been done, you can't say that something else was a cause, in fact, of it happening. So in that case, defendant's off the hook. Even though defendant was negligent, they're off the hook because there's no way there was nothing for that fire to burn down. Now let's switch it up. Let's say same thing, natural fire, negligent fire, and the negligently fire gets there first. So the negligently fire started fire gets there first, burns it all to the ground, and just not even 20 minutes later, the naturally started fire gets there and burns down the house. Now, if we could say that the negligently started fire burned down the garage and the naturally started fire burned down the, a, a different part of the house, then we could separate it out. We could say, but for the negligently started fire, the garage wouldn't have burned down. And but for the naturally started fire, the front porch wouldn't have burned down. But since the negligently negligently started fire, burned down the whole house, um, we can't say that it wasn't a cause, in fact, of the house being burned down. But then you say, but that's not very fair because the house was going to be burned down 20 minutes later by the naturally started fire. Um, and the answer is, well, that's just too bad. Um, because the negligently started fire 
was started um, did actually do the damage, the negligently started fire, um, is a cause, in fact, of the harm. Instead, um, it's going to go to a question of damages. So how much was the house worth that the negligently started fire burned down? Well, it might have been worth a lot, but if it was about to be burned down by the other fire, it couldn't have been worth that much. You can think about this um, in terms of uh, a human life, which might be a little morbid, but we get morbid in torts quite a bit. So um, let's say that a train runs somebody over. Well, if the person that the train ran over had many years to live, then there's going to be more damages than if the person was going to die of had some terminal disease and was known that they were going to die a day or two later. Um, the train was just as negligent, but the amount of harm isn't as great. And so it's the same thing here where the negligently started fire gets there first. It causes all of the harm. It caused the house to burn to the ground. But the amount of damages might not be as much um, because the naturally started fire was going to get there shortly anyway. The takeaway point here is to realize that when it's the cause in fact, it is the cause in fact. Um, regardless whether there might have been some other cause in fact later on. Um, since the causes were not concurrent, then the negligently started fire is the cause in fact. More time. So let's say that there were two negligently started fires. Defendant one started one fire, defendant two started another fire, and lo and behold, the fires merged and they burned down the whole house. Here again, if the fires wouldn't have merged and they would have each burned down different parts of the house, we could attribute some of the house to defendant one and some of the house to defendant two. But since they merged, it's really difficult to know which person's fire burned down which parts of the house because they merged together. So if we did a cause and fact analysis here, um, let's first look at how many negligent parties there were. Just like the uh, alternate liability hypo, we've got more than one negligent party. We've got two defendants, both of them negligently started a fire. Then we ask how many of these parties actually contributed to the harm? Well, now remember with the alternate liability, there was just one piece of buckshot that got into the person's eye. Here, the fires merged. Both of them worked together to burn down the house. Um, now, so if we apply but for causation, we ask if the defendant one had not negligently lit the fire, would the plaintiff have suffered his house burning down? Well, if defendant one hadn't done it, then defendant two's fire probably would have burned down the house. So we don't have but for causation. Well, then we ask, okay, if defendant two had not negligently lit a fire, would the plaintiff have suffered a burned down house? And the answer is, well, if defendant two wouldn't have lit the fire, then defendant one's fire probably would have burned down the house. So we don't have but for causation. Well, this is a problem if you're the person whose house has been burned to the ground by two negligent people. Um, you want to be able to sue them. They had a duty, they breached the duty, but you're unable to show cause and fact simply because they both happen to be negligent um, in a way that makes it difficult to prove um, or in a, in a way that makes causation hard to show, at least but for causation. So we come up with a our second exception to but for causation. And that is the substantial factor test. So under the substantial factor test, a defendant can be held liable for all of plaintiff's damages, despite there being another cause, if the defendant's negligence would have by itself been enough to cause the harm. So if the defendant one who started the fire started a fire big enough to burn down the whole house, then we're going to hold them liable even though defendant two's negligent um, 
was also a cause, um, or even though the two fires merged and also contributed to the harm. So essentially, what you're asking, rather than um, when but for causation has failed because um, there's another person who would have caused the exact same harm, then we ask, okay, would the defendant's negligence by itself have been enough to cause the plaintiff's harm? If it would, then we say under the substantial factor test, the defendant's negligence was a substantial factor in causing the harm. And hey, you know what? That's good enough for me. You're liable. All right, so we've talked about but for causation. We've talked about analyzing, and, and we've talked about two co exceptions to but for causation. Now we're going to talk about analyzing probabilities. Now don't freak out. Students very often freak out because they think that this involves math. All it involves is multiplying by two. That's all it involves. It's not, it's, don't freak out. It's going to be okay. So we're moving on, on to analysis under but for causation um, of probabilities. So we're not talking about an exception yet. Um, we're just going back to but for causation. In a little bit, though, we will also mention briefly the loss of chance doctrine. So as I say, don't freak out. It's not really math. As we talked about earlier, plaintiff has the burden of showing that it is more likely than not that the defendant's negligence um, was the cause, in fact, of the plaintiff's damages. So what that means, when we say more likely than not, well, that means more than 50%. So essentially, plaintiff has to show that there's at least a 51% chance that the harm would not have occurred but for defendant's conduct. So when we get down to, well, how likely is it that the plaintiff would have been just fine and not suffered the harm um, had the defendant not been negligent? We want to know, we need to come up with some numbers in some cases, especially when you start involving expert witnesses who will tell you there was a this percent chance of that happening. So, in other words, the defendant's neg negligence has to double the chances of plaintiff suffering the harm. So, if you're walking down the road and um, you have your shoelaces untied and you trip and fall, you can look back and you can say, okay, um, did having the shoelaces untied more than double your chances of tripping and falling. Well, it depends on how um, agile and clumsy you are. If you're the type of person who's going to fall no matter what, whether you tie your shoelaces or not, then the shoelaces were not the cause and effect of falling. It was your clumsiness. If, on the other hand, you're light on your feet and delicate, as I'm sure I am um, not, then uh, the shoelaces would probably be the cause. In fact, because it certainly, you don't usually fall on the ground, but having untied shoelaces more than doubled your chances of falling on the ground. All right, let's talk about another case. This is a beautiful case. There is this sailor named Gardner who fell over off his ship. Apparently this happens sometimes. You're on a boat, you're sailing out in deep waters, and you fall off. Um, it, him falling off wasn't due to the captain's negligence, but the captain decided not to go searching for Gardner. He said, oh, yeah, he's gone. I'll just keep on trucking. So he keeps going. I kind of wonder what kind of relationship Gardner had with his captain. Um, in any case, the captain just keeps on going. Gardner drowns. Now we're going to play with the facts a little bit. So we assume that the 
the captain owed a duty. I mean, there was certainly a special relationship between an employer and an employee. An employer has a duty to use reasonable care to prevent harm to the to the employee. And um, most likely, when somebody falls off your boat and you're the employer, that duty includes at least looking for the person who fell off the water rather than just, you know, pedal to the metal, let's keep going, I don't want to be late. Of course, you can do a hand analysis and decide whether that's true in this case. But let's just assume that, yeah, it would have been more reasonable or it would have been reasonable and prudent to stop and at least, you know, spend an hour or two trying to find the poor guy who fell off the boat. Of course, it was a moonless night. So, if the defendant had attempted a rescue, would the plaintiff have drowned? Um, that's kind of hard to answer. Let's think about this a little bit. Um, because it really depends on the circumstances. So, if a gardener fell over into shark-infested waters, um, would he be more or less likely to have been rescued? Let's think about this. Under which circumstances is it more likely that the captain's failure to, to immediately attempt a rescue is the cause of Gardner's death? If he fell into shark-infested waters or if he fell into warm blue waters that were nice, like taking a bath? Let's try it out. So assume that Gardner fell overboard into shark-infested waters. Even if the captain would have tried to rescue Gardner, there's only a 20% chance that Gardner would have lived. Because even if he turned around, those sharks, they come right after him, boom, he would have been eaten just in, in, in a few minutes. So there was only a 20% chance that if the, guard, the captain turned around, um, he would have caught Gardner before he was shark food. Under, but for causation, is it more likely than not that the defendant's negligence is a cause of plaintiff's harm? Well, no. Gardner, Gardner was going to drown anyway, or he was going to be eaten by sharks anyway. Gardner, probably 80% likely, was going to die no matter what the captain did. We can even graph this. Okay, so the likelihood if there had been no negligence versus the likelihood with negligence. Um, the chance of him dying with the, with, when the guard was negligent, um, excuse me, the chance of him drowning because he fell into shark-infested water was 80%. He was going to die. Sharks were going to eat him. By not turning around to go save Gardner, the captain didn't more than double the chances of poor Mr. Gardner dying. Um, 80 times 2 is way over 100. So he was sure to die um, since the captain didn't go rescue him, but he didn't more than double the chances of Gardner dying. And thus we have no cause in fact. Let's change the story a little bit. Let's say that Gardner fell over into warm blue waters like a bathtub. He's just out there nice. If the captain had tried to rescue Gardner, there's a 60% chance that Gardner would have lived. Or in other words, 40% chance that Gardner was going to die before the boat got there. So under but for causation, is it more likely than not that defendant's negligence is the cause of plaintiff's harm? Stated in other words, if the captain had turned around and gone back to try and pick up Gardner, um, is it more likely than not that it would have saved Gardner's life? And on these facts, yeah. So um, he had a 40% chance of drowning once he hit the water, no matter what happened. Whether he went back for him or not, there was a 40% chance that Gardner would drown because either he wasn't that good of a swimmer or there was an occasional shark or what have you. By not turning around and attempting to rescue Gardner, um, the captain raised the chance of him dying from 40% to 100% because you can only like hang out in the water so long before you drown. 
So let's look at this graphically. So there was a 40% likelihood once he fell in the water of him dying. Um, by failing to even attempt to rescue, the captain more than doubled the chance of him dying, moving it up to 100%, from 40% to 100%. So all we're really doing is we're saying, okay, was the did the defendant's negligent more than double the chance of the bad thing happening? And usually the bad thing is death um, in these cases. So here's a story you hear over and over again in medical malpractice cases. Plaintiff goes to see his doctor saying that he has a headache. The doctor misdiagnoses the plaintiff as having a migraine and sends him home to sleep it off. You're good, just go home. Take two aspirin, call me in the morning. A week later, the headache is still persisting. So he goes to see a different doctor because, you know, it's just, I don't trust that guy. The new doctor diagnoses the plaintiff as having brain cancer. Now, just a uh, uh, caveat here, I'm not a doctor. I don't know if this is even possible that a headache would be a sign of brain cancer, but I'm just throwing it out there as a hypothetical. And let's say the plaintiff dies of brain cancer. Um, the question is, was the first doctor's negligent a cause in fact of the defendant's death? Well, in order to know that, we need to know what was the likelihood that the defendant was going to die anyway. When he walked into the office of the first doctor and said, I, had a head I have a headache, if he had a 99% chance of dying at that point, then nothing that doctor could have done, even if he had correctly diagnosed him, would have saved the plaintiff. If, on the other hand, if when he walked into the first doctor's office, he only had a 10% chance of dying, but because it was misdiagnosed, um, he ended up dying um, because it was too late to treat that, then certainly um, the misdiagnosis more than doubled the chance of him dying. In fact, it, it made him die. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, here's my magic um, uh, tool for discerning whether uh, something is the but-for cause of something else when we're using numbers. So when it's unclear whether the harm was because of defendant's fault, um, basically defendant's negligence, or whether it was bound to happen regardless of anything the defendant did, we use these steps to determine if defendant's negligence was a but-for cause of the plaintiff's harm. First, you want to think about what's the plaintiff complaining about? Usually the plaintiff died, but maybe it's the plaintiff um, suffered some injury or something like that. Then we ask, what's the likelihood of that happening if the defendant had not been negligent? So we're going to pluck out the negligence of the defendant and say, if they would have done everything right, what was the likelihood of this bad thing happening? If the number is greater than 50%, then negligence can't be the but for cause because essentially they were going to die anyway or they were going to suffer that harm no matter what. Um, well, not no matter what, but more likely than not, they were going to suffer the harm regardless. And since more likely than not means 51%, then there's no way that the doctor's negligence was more than a 50% cause because you can only go up to 100 so if this number is 50% or less, you have to go on to the next step. Next we ask, what's the likelihood of the harm happening um, when the defendant was actually negligent? And if this number is more than double the number from step two, then the defendant's negligence is the but-for cause of plaintiff's harm. All right. So let's try this out. Or actually, um, you have some opportunities to try this out in your
uh, worksheet that you're filling it filling out for class so so that's the tools that you want to go through but I did want to mention one exception and this is an exception it's not the rule you when you see probabilities you do not jump to the loss of chance rule but there is this rule loss of chance um, that says well you know what it's just not fair when people die and they were bound to die either way or when they they lose something and they were bound to lose it either way that a, a doctor um, should get off the hook so the loss of chance rule which is not the majority rule um, it doesn't apply in most jurisdictions but it does apply in some jurisdictions so you want to watch out for if something says under the loss of chance rule so when there is a 50% or less chance that the defendant's misdiagnosis caused the harm, normally we'd say the defendant's off the hook. But the, under the loss of chance exception, they'll say the plaintiff may still recover for a portion of plaintiff's damages representing the increased possibility of harm caused by the defendant's misdiagnosis. So what we'll do is we'll work through some of these hypotheticals um, without the loss of chance and then work through some with the loss of chance and try and understand the distinction but essentially um, unless the defendant's negligence more than doubled the chance of the harm happening the uh, defendant's negligence was not a but-for cause of the harm however under loss of chance if it wasn't a but-for cause even though it's not a but-for cause of the harm some courts will say, yeah, but we're going to let them recover at least something because of the negligence, which is a little bit contrary to, to what everything else has said so far. But that's why it's an exception, just like um, the other two exceptions. Yay, we're almost done. Okay, so just a quick summary. First, always apply but for causation before applying an exception. An exception always but for causation comes first if you see numbers you don't jump to the loss of chance if you see multiple defendants you don't jump to substantial factor or alternate liability you wait you try but for causation first next if the plaintiff can't prove but for causation try an exception if only one party contributed to the harm and plaintiff just can't prove which one it was apply alternate liability this is rare doesn't come up that much except you know among law professors if more than one party or event contributed to the injury apply the substantial factor test this tends to come up quite a bit when there's more than one party and you cannot use and but for causation doesn't isn't satisfied because a lot of times when there's more than one party but for causation will still be satisfied as we talked about with the late student and drunk driver um, but if but for doesn't work then you can go on and try the substantial factor test freak out about probabilities um, all you have to do is look at whether the defendants negligent um, more than doubled the risk of harm and in, in cases where you'd want to do that you would see numbers in the question and you'd want to say okay the percentage of dying was this before the negligence the defense li likelihood of, di of dying was this after the negligence and just say did it more than double if it did boom cause in fact if not boom no cause in fact so um, I hope this has been helpful and enjoyable um, and not too long I will leave you with a uh, limerick about cause in fact goes something like this causation is hard to assess when the harm is done eh, more or less to test cause in fact just remove the bad act and see if harm comes nonetheless yeah maybe too cute by half thank you and see you in class